really excited to welcome all the attendees to this webinar. Um, we've got a, a really fantastic audience comprised of local, state, federal legislative staff, government agencies, academia, and also some private sector and nonprofit organizations joining us today. I'm Jennifer Poulikidis, the Associate Vice Chancellor of Government and Community Relations at UCLA. A, a key role of government relations at UCLA and at each of the UC campuses is to communicate to legislators, government officials, and other stakeholders the impact of the world-class education and groundbreaking research we conduct. We're very excited about this event focused on an extremely significant issue for California and our policymakers at all levels of government. We're also very pleased to demonstrate the collaborative expertise of the UC campuses and other universities across the state on this important topic. So I'll begin with some logistics. Um, this session is being recorded and attendees will all receive a link to the recording once we have posted it online. After some uh, opening remarks, we will begin the session with a presentation from a couple of our researchers, and then we'll reserve the balance of the time of the session for Q&A. Um, as for Q&A, I encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A chat box. Uh, from there, our Q&A moderator, David Sa from University of San Francisco, will select questions from the audience to ask our panel of experts. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can, time permitting. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to Roger Wakimoto, uh, UCLA's Vice Chancellor for Research, who will kick things off with some introductory remarks. Dr. Wakimoto has had an incredible career so far. He has been Vice Chancellor of Research at UCLA since 2017, but he had been a member of UCLA's Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences faculty for over 20 years and served as chair of the department for five of those years. He was called away for eight years to Colorado to serve as the director of the Earth Observing Laboratory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, also known as INCAR. And then he subsequently became director of INCAR itself. Just before he was recruited back to UCLA to be our vice chancellor for research, Dr. Wakimoto ran the Geosciences Directorate at the National Science Foundation in the Washington DC area for about four or five years. UCLA and California is fortunate to have him back here now where he brings his expertise and national and international perspective to bear on how the research our institutions conduct can benefit our state and the people of California. I turn it over to Roger Wakimoto. So thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, for that uh, kind invitation uh, to speak. So I wanna thank all of you for participating in this webinar on an incredibly important topic. Uh, some facts, just as of a couple of weeks ago, wildfires in California have burned a record 4.2 million acres damage or destroyed over 10,000 structures and have killed 35 people. And the season is not even over as people down at Irvine uh, don't need to be reminded. Uh, it's pretty amazing this past year, six of the top 20 largest wildfires, an astounding five of the top 10 wildfires, if you burrow down a little bit more, have occurred just in this year with the largest ever occurring this year. In my mind, we've clearly joined the other two prominent communities, tornado season in the Midwest, hurricane season in the Southeast, when our state is on high alert and our residents truly fear what the wildfire season will bring in any given year. Now, climate change has certainly contributed to this increase, but there are other factors at play as you will hear today. The University of California is a unique system with incredible assets and expertise across all of our campuses. Our research capabilities can work synergistically with not only our campuses, but other universities. And we hope we could work with wildfire responders in order to address and become more resilient to a problem that is predicted to only become more worse, worse in the foreseeable future. 
Now, our goal is that we can work in close partnership with the state of California and many other of you that, that are in the audience while offering the collective research prowess of the UC system. So with that brief introduction, I'd like to now introduce our first speaker and that's Alex Hall. Uh, Alex Hall is a professor in, in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and also the director of the Center for Climate Science at UCLA. His research is aimed at predicting and understanding climate change impacts at scales relevant to decision makers, especially in the state of California. Alex and his team are currently studying the future of wildfire in California and are working with water management agencies in the Los Angeles research region to ensure sustainability of water resources under climate change. So Alex, the floor is yours. Great, um, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, let me start to share my screen here. Okay, are we good to go? All right. Um, well, again, I wanna um, thank the um, um, UCL Government Relations and, and Dr. Wakimoto for welcoming me and, um, and introducing me. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about wildfire, obviously. We've had really dramatic increases in wildfire in California um, and they've been extremely costly. We have lost a lot of human life um, and we've had great uh, degree of property destruction in California in the past few years. We've had severe inconvenience in the form of shutdowns of the electricity grid. We have been breathing some pretty unhealthy air um, for extended periods of time. And we've had huge direct costs exceeding um, about $10 billion a year. So really dramatic um, changes recently. Um, the, um, the, um, the, these, these have um, resulted in, um, this, has been, this has been the result of really a, a century of, of mistakes. Um, we've had suppression of wildfire, um, which has resulted in the buildup of fuels in the landscape. And um, this has led to bigger fires when they actually occur. We've had building of, of, of structures in the wildland urban interface. Um, and that has put people and property at risk when wildfires occur. And we've been emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And this has resulted in warmer temperatures, um, hotter winds and drier winds leading to bigger and bigger fires. And our approach to this crisis has been reactive rather than proactive. So every year the fires get worse and we're like the proverbial deer in the headlights. We're confronted with crises and we deal with these emergencies as they arise. And in many cases, there's been real heroism in dealing with them. But again, our response has been piecemeal and reactive. So how do we transform our response from being piecemeal and reactive to holistic and proactive? Research has a huge role to play here. Our ability to predict and manage wildfire stems in large part from a lack of understanding of natural and human processes relating to fire. And in response to the dramatic increases in wildfire, we've had multiple funding opportunities that have arisen over the past three years or so that have given rise to multiple projects. These projects address critical but disparate pieces of the problem. And we are speaking to you today as representatives of these projects. To begin coordinating them, we've created an informal collaborative in the fall of 2020 that's made up of representatives from critical topic areas. I'd like to introduce the researchers from across California together in this so far informal climate and wildfire collaborative. We have Dr. Laura Kippers from UC Berkeley, David Marvin from Salo Sciences, David Sa from the University of San Francisco, Michele Barbato from UC Davis, Roger Bales from UC Merced, Leroy Westerling from UC Merced, Leila Carvalho, UC Santa Barbara, Charles Jones, UC Santa Barbara, myself, Sean Hecht from UCLA, Kelly Barsante, UC Riverside, Mike Goulden, UC Irvine, Tutha Bernergi, UC Irvine, and Ilke Altintis, UC San Diego. 
I'm speaking to you today on behalf of these incredible researchers. And later you'll have a chance to interact with them in the Q&A. As you can see, we have representation from major academic and research institutions across the state. We've come together with a shared sense of alarm and urgency. California is at a critical juncture in its relationship with wildfire, and we know that we have to help. This effort builds on a workshop that was organized by state agencies in November 2019. Our first task has been to analyze the existing projects in, large, in light of the larger research needs. We've already concluded that a much more focused and organized effort must be undertaken if we're to be successful in predicting and managing wildfire. And today, I wanna to tell you how we came to that conclusion. Let's first take a step back and think more broadly about what managing wildfire risk really means. Let's ask ourselves what goals must be achieved in order for Californians to have a healthy and sustainable relationship with wildfire. Here are some of the most important of those goals. We need to have effective insurance and financial risk management systems. We need to have clean air when fires occur. We need compensation for wildfire victims. We need to have health, we need to have um, health, healthy human populations. We need to make sure that wildfire does not um, disproportionately impact communities that are already disadvantaged in other ways. We need healthy ecosystems. Fire is a critical ecosystem process, and we need to make sure that it's performing its function in our ecosystems. We want to make sure that there's no net negative greenhouse gas emissions. We know that when fires burn, they emit greenhouse gases um, in the form of carbon emissions, and we need to make sure that that's not a net, um, a net positive emission. We need to make sure that our local governments are working in sync with larger wildfire management strategies. We need to make sure that, the, that our water systems are producing clean water and that they're not impaired by fire. We need to make sure that our, our built environment is resilient to wildfire. And then finally, we need to make sure that our energy infrastructure is resilient. We can think of these goals collectively as the dream that we're ultimately trying to achieve. So the next question is, what are the capabilities that we need to, need to develop to live this dream? Here are some of the most important capabilities that we need to develop. In the realm of the natural sciences, we need to improve our ability to model fire risk and fire behavior. We need to have robust observing systems of our natural landscapes, of fire and hydrologic conditions. We need to be able to simulate extreme weather, especially in the context of climate change. We need to be able to predict the response of our landscapes and fire to climate and management of those landscapes. And we need to be able to inventory emissions and make air quality forecasts. In the realm of the social sciences, we also have we have um, needs. We have to be able to predict the impacts of wildfire on multiple segments of our populations. We need to be predicting impacts of land use and housing policy on fire risk. And we need to design financial risk and insurance systems to address wildfire risks. And finally, we need capacity in areas that we might lump into the category of coordination and implementation. Things like computational and big data infrastructure, energy and technology solutions, and most importantly, we need participation of our communities. We need participation of the public, and we need stakeholders in key agencies in the federal, local, and state governments to help us shape the research agenda. If we develop these capabilities, then we have a chance to develop that healthy and sustainable relationship with wildfire in California. So this is the whole that we're trying to achieve. 
Next, I want to step through some of the largest and most important projects that have been funded over the last three years or so. And there are eight of these projects. They're collaborative projects and they involve more than one principal investigator. And they're typically on the scale of a few million dollars. I'm gonna describe each of these projects and highlight where in this diagram of critical capabilities the work is concentrated. Of course, each project is narrower in scope than these broad capabilities. So for example, a particular project might be, um, might be preoccupied with mapping the spread of, of wildfire when it occurs. And that would fit into the category of this observatory of ecological and hydrological conditions. It's one of our needs, but that's just one piece of that larger puzzle. So no one project um, is a complete build out of any of these capability areas. But this exercise will give you a sense of which cap capabilities are getting more attention and which are getting less. The first project is transforming prescribed fire practices for California. And the goal of this project is to increase the pace and scale of prescribed fires in California through field measurements and modeling of fire. It's funded by the UCOP lab fees program and the total funding is about $3.6 million. This project ends in 2023. This is a natural science focused project and it deals with the knowledge and decision support tools needed to implement prescribed fires in the landscape. And this is an example of a deep dive into a critical aspect of fire behavior but it is an isolation from the other aspects that also shape fire behavior. So you can see the three different capability areas that this project is addressing. The second project is the Center for Ecosystem Climate Solutions. The goal of this project is to develop and communicate new solutions to the management of California's natural lands for climate change. The funder is the California Strategic Growth Council and the total funding amount is $4.6 million. This project will end in 2022. This project is focused on carbon and forest management, working with land managers to improve current practices. They are refining our understanding of our environmental history and current practices. And this is critical baseline information for other projects that are more focused on the future. The third project is wildfire induced air pollution assessment and mitigation. And the goal here is to advance methods for the model modeling of wildfire spread, um, transport of pollutants and air quality forecasting, as well as to develop baseline data for predicting health outcomes and quantifying the effectiveness of mitigation strategies. <clears throat> and this is funded also by the UCP lab fees program. The total funding amount is $4.8 million and the project will end in 2023. This project is a deep dive into the impacts of wildfire on air quality. And the knowledge gained from this project could be leveraged for understanding long-term air quality impacts. The fourth project is the California Forest Observatory. This project is aiming to produce a high resolution data-driven forest monitoring system that maps the drivers of wildfire hazard from space. It's funded by the Moore Foundation and the Tahoe Fund, and the total funding is about $1.5 million. The um, project will end in 2020, although it will be operational um, after that. And this project is aimed at providing the real-time information that's needed by the next generation of fire behavior models. And these activities form a critical building block for the much larger problem of improving fire behavior prediction. The fifth project is California Ecosystem Futures. The goal of this project is to understand the dynamics of fire and ecosystems in California and to simulate their future behavior it is funded by the UC Lab Fees Program with a total amount of $3 million and it'll be ending next year in 2021. This project is very natural science focused. It examines the changes in fire due to climate change by the end of the 21st century, but it's not building out capacity in critical areas related to climate change, such as air quality impacts. And of course, 
social science areas critical for climate change adaptation are also unrepresented. The sixth project is mitigating and managing extreme wildfire risk in California. And the goal of this project is to increase the resilience of California's electricity system to climate change and wildfires, including extreme fire weather and vegetation management. It's funded by the UCOP Lab Fees Program. The total is $3.3 million, and it is slated to end in 2023. This project is a deep dive into the vulnerability of electri electricity infrastructure during extreme fire weather events. And this is obviously very relevant as we think about re-engineering the grid for wildfire resilience. The seventh project is workflows integrating collaborative hazard sciences. The goal is to cre create collaborative data-driven solutions for integrating artificial intelligence and compu computing into fire science and response. The funder is the US National Science Foundation. The total is $3.6 million and this project will end in 2021. This project is focused on providing computational infrastructure and computer science tools to enable the next generation of wildfire behavior models. And there is enormous opportunity to leverage these tools ac across a much broader cross-section of other critical research areas. And the eighth and final project is Pyrogens. The goal of this project is to improve understanding of wildfire spread, extreme weather, and long-term changes in fire risk and transmit that understanding to policymakers, state agencies, utilities, and the public. The funder is the California Energy Commission and the total is about $5 million. This project will end in 2024. This is an example of a project focused on integrating wildfire science at a range of timescales. And in this sense, it's a model of the deeper coordination that we so desperately need. But this project is dependent on many advances and expertise from unaffiliated projects. So for example, um, this project does not produce its own projections of future extreme fire weather, but it needs those projections in order to actually fulfill its own project objectives. So it's, there's an example of a dependency across projects. So that's our overview of the large multi-institutional projects. There are many other activities too, involving scientists at the US Forest Service, US Geological Survey, as well as individual PI level efforts. And these projects have tremendous value, but each has its own limitations. And critically, they're not the result of a larger research strategy around wildfire and climate change. Instead, they represent a scattered collection of activities developed in response to individual funding opportunities. It's also clear that there are latent synergies and leveraging opportunities across the project projects. But without further development and coordination, there is no guarantee those opportunities will be pursued. So I want to um, introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Laura Coopers. She's at Berkeley and she is an ecosystem science um, and she models California's unique forest, grassland and chaparral ecosystems. And she will be telling you more about these gaps and opportunities. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, next slide, please. So as Alex noted, there are a host of technical, organizational, legal, financial, and other capacities that are required to understand and predict wildfire risk and its effects on California's people, wildlands, and economy, and that are required to mitigate and adapt to these risks. The ongoing research is developing important capacity. Oh, Alex, I think we lost your slide. Can you, can you uh, stay in the presentation? Great, thank you. Okay, terrific. 
Thanks. Okay, so the ongoing research, um, as Alex just um, uh, documented really, is developing important capacity. But while impressive in many ways, the current scope of research undertaken across the state has still left gaps that are regularly leaving us in crisis mode. Next slide. There are important gaps in the fundamental science within and between these high level capacities that Alex reviewed. So for example, as much as we already understand about fire risk and fire behavior, surface winds are poorly simulated in our climate and weather models especially at the landscape scales of relevance to fire, making it a challenge to develop short and long-term forecasts of fire behavior. In addition, physics-based fire spread models developed for small spatial scales are not linked with large-scale wildfire models, leaving uncertainties and gaps in predictions. We also have limited capabilities for modeling wildfire spread in the wildland urban interface and for heterogeneous fuels. And the nature of the WUI varies widely around the state. Sophisticated vegetation models are not yet designed to simulate California's unique and diverse ecosystems and changing fire regimes, which have co-evolved with each other. We also have limited data on the effectiveness of different vegetation management strategies, even though implementation of these strategies is expanding rapidly. And as a final example, we have incomplete data on smoke emissions, which of course is critical to understanding health and other impacts. So this is an incomplete list of gaps, but gives some sense of just some of the outstanding technical challenges. Next slide. The list of financial, legal, governance, behavioral and related research gaps is arguably even more, more important. These capacities are crucial for developing new approaches to limiting exposure and adapting California to climate and wildfire risk. For example, we need to understand and address limits to current legal policy and governance structures for risk mitigation and compensation. We know this is an issue, for example, with fires ignited by faulty electrical equipment. The challenge is currently being addressed in an ad hoc manner, such as through propositions, and we need to do better. We also need a better understanding of how land use governance affects wildfire risks and potential governance models that minimize or mitigate those risks. The lack of affordable housing in urban centers is intertwined with this issue. It is essential that we develop a deeper understanding of the differential and inequitable impacts of wildfire on people and of associated policy solutions. For example, those who work outdoors or who have pre-existing health conditions, including from chronic air pollution, have greater risks from wildfire smoke. Understanding this type of differential impact is important because it has big implications for the policies we pursue. We also need to develop approaches to incorporating wildfire risk signals into equitable insurance pricing. Essentially, we have to figure out how to balance affordability with disincentives for living in high risk areas. And this is not an easy problem to solve. It's also the case that data are limited on perceptions of wildfire risk and how climate change affects that risk. People's inability to fully understand risk needs to be incorporated in the policies we pursue as well. And as a final example, information on responses to potential adaptation policies including incentives that drive these responses is extremely limited. For communities that are facing really difficult choices, what policies could actually work to lower the risk, whether it's more aggressive land management or even buyouts as is being considered for flood risk. Again, this is not a comprehensive list of gaps but gives a sense of current research needs. Next slide. Beyond the needed depth in technical and non-technical capacities, there are also critical gaps in coordination, integration, and implementation of the growing knowledge base. For example, fire, vegetation, climate, air quality, and hydrology models are not integrated into a single framework, making it really impossible to quantify interactions among these. There's limited data integration with models of post-fire impacts, 
such as degraded water quality or landslides or debris flow risks. The mechanisms to coordinate the research are weak to non-existent and mechanisms to ensure the research is shaped by the needs of local, state and federal agencies are also weak to non-existent. The infrastructure to provide useful information to those outside the research community is still being built uh, and is itself under-resourced. So while these gaps are significant, California's research community is motivated and has the skill sets to meet these challenges. We breathe the same air, we evacuate our homes when they're at risk, and we worry about the future of our communities and landscapes, just as every other Californian does. Next slide. So we started today with a giant question of how to predict and manage California's fire risk in a changing climate in order to achieve resilient infrastructure and healthy communities and ecosystems. Next slide. The projects that Alex discussed today are working to put tools, understanding and infrastructure in place that address some of these really essential capacities. Next slide. But to fully address this huge challenge, many more pieces must be put into place. So as Alex illustrated, we really need to fully build out these emerging capacities. We need to create new capabilities in critical areas where they're embryonic still. We need to really coordinate and integrate across these areas. And we need to build the capacity for implementation of this growing knowledge base. Next slide. So critically, we need sustained knowledge generation to better respond to emerging needs that's supported by an organizational structure that can effectively coordinate and act on emerging tools and understanding. We're at a key point in California's history where we can shift from a reactive as Alex said, deer in the headlights approach to a proactive approach. We're already seeing the direct effects of climate change and we know it's going to get worse. To not meet this challenge with the full capacities of the state would be irresponsible. Next slide. So at this point, I'd really like to thank you for your attention to our presentation and transition us to the Q&A and discussion portion of today's webinar. And to do that, next slide, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, uh, Dr. David Saw, who's a professor and director of the Geospatial Analysis Lab at the University of San Francisco. And Thank he you. will be moderating the discussion. So, David. Thanks, Laura. How are, thanks. <laughs> there are a lot of questions and there are a lot of people. Um, just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, here are our panelists. Um, they come from across the state. Uh, and I see some questions that are piling in right now. Um, this is just an example of the folks that we have as part of the consortium. There's a lot more people and a lot more items that fall be, uh, underneath them or you know, as part of the program itself. So what I'm hoping we could do uh, is to line, um, line up questions in the Q&A section for the attendees. And what I'm going to I'm going to try to pick out those questions to go after those main um, uh, challenges that Laura and Alex put out for us. Does that sound okay with everybody? So panelists, can you guys turn on your uh, video screens? There we go. How's everybody doing? Little mic check. Give me a thumbs up if you could hear me. Yay! This is going to be exciting. So if we if we take a step back, right, and we say, okay, there's all this work that's actually happening, and there's all this demand that's happening, and there's the need to integrate um, all this science uh, into all those different factors that Alex talked about, all those blue circles that Alex talked about, and we have challenges of integrating additional voices like indigenous people, uh, or the concerns of a utility grid, or the concerns of a policymaker. Can, can somebody uh, identify how this sort of collaborative could help meet all those dimensional needs while pulling science from applied so based research to applied research to applications? Does somebody want to give that a shot? 
maybe I'll point to Leroy because we I know we've talked about this quite a bit. The continuum of information to multiple stakeholders. What are your, how could a consortium uh, be able to do that in a way where a simple project couldn't? That's a really broad question, David. Thanks for passing it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'll try to put together like four or five different questions that are coming in here. <laughs> So I, I think part of it is uh, is a you need to have a two way conversation, right? So um, a lot of times, an end user doesn't know what you can provide, and if they're asking for you to provide something that's in the in the in the format of what they've used historically, with say observational data or something of that nature, there can be a mismatch. So it's almost like you have to go in and understand how they're making their decisions and assess uh, how that could be reshaped to, in order to incorporate the kinds of information that can be provided. So you need not just a one-way interpretation, but you need to be able to work with the end users. And that requires um, a lot of capacity that these individual projects don't have, and it requires a lot of continuity in the relationships. And, and that's where a consortium uh, can really build that capacity because uh, it can provide resources for ongoing outreach relationships. Wonderful. Um, before I go on to the next one, does anybody want to add to that? Just feel free to stick your hand up and I'll pick on you. Gone once, going twice. Great. Okay. Oh, go ahead, Kel. So thanks. I was actually starting to type in the chat, but I think <laughs> I'm, I'm slow. So I would just say that I think this is an excellent example of what a collaborative like this could achieve is to help amplify these voices. Because I think that maybe many of us could give examples of how we've interacted with, you know, the indigenous communities, or we've been in meetings where we've heard about burn practices and all of the different things going on, but it's how we bring those resources together and to bear on our sort of most pressing problems. Oh, that's wonderful. So that's um, one thing that's neat about that. Oh, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I wanted to, to build on that and say there is also a question of uh, avoiding uh, reproducing the same efforts and uh, having access uh, to the results of the other groups. Because at the end of the day, we all need the information on uh, um, how the wildfires will uh, develop in the future. And then maybe someone is focusing more on what is happening uh, now and someone is focusing more on what is happening in forecast in 20, 30 years. But uh, the basic information uh, that we need uh, is kind of common to the different project. We need to know where is the highest risk of wildfire, what we can do to reduce it, and, uh, and then work toward the, the specific problem. So it's also a better use of resources uh, uh, to have uh, some uh, point or reference uh, on who's doing uh, each of the different items uh, that are needed uh, to solve uh, a real uh, societal problem, because it, it's really a lot of different uh, things uh, that require different expertise. Uh, it has to be multidisciplinary. It has to go from social science uh, to natural science. Uh, it has to go to engineering. It has to go to technology. Uh, it has to go to governance, uh, community. There is no one that can just do everything. No. Uh, and, and that's why we need to work all together. Yeah, no, that's true, that's true. And I, I saw a couple other questions fly through here. One of them was specific, you know, how do we integrate, how do we do something with a risk finance and insurance? And, and then tied to that indirectly is, well, how does, you know, there's, there's a social aspect and a policy aspect all interweaved, Michael, to kind of build on what you're talking about. And I know, Sean, you've thought a lot about those sorts of things. I don't know if you want to be able to comment to, to those concepts. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate uh, uh, the questions. So, of course, there is social science research going on throughout the UC system that relates to these questions. There are economists right now who are working on thinking about how 
uh, how rate making in the insurance context and other, uh, you know, other uh, types of, uh, of tools can be used to address wildfire risk. Uh, there are folks who are working uh, not only you know, in, in, in economics, but also in anthropology and sociology, folks who are looking at the ways in which, like Liz Kozloff at, at, uh, at UCLA, uh, who looks at the, the, the social factors that go into people's response to, uh, to, to climate threats and under what conditions people might uh, be uh, uh, find retreat, for example, to be an acceptable option versus various kinds of mitigation. So those types of research are going on. I think one of the, the challenges that, uh, that this initiative speaks to is the question of how all that gets integrated together with science modeling and the scientific aspects of this. Uh, I think there have been a lot of initiatives in recent years to try to create multidisciplinary and multi-campus uh, research initiatives. Um, and it's a challenging thing to do. And really part of the goal of this project is to create the conditions for more effective collaboration uh, in, in, in those areas. As, a, um, as, as a, someone in the law school, I work on governance issues that affect all of these things uh, and you know, have worked with scientists and, and social scientists throughout the system, but, uh, but it, it's challenging to figure out how to do the most effective collaborations and then how to get the work uh, integrated into policy. Um, and so these are all good questions. The research is going on, even though uh, it, it wasn't highlighted in the particular examples that Alex gave. Um, but I want to, uh, you know, assure everybody that there's a lot of that work happening. And part of the, the goal of this is just to figure out how to put it all together in the most effective way. So Marcy has a, a lot of uh, put out a great question. There's a lot of support for it. Maybe I could ask it to the group and I see who could respond to it. Uh, Marcy asks, are there any indigenous partners in the California Climate and Wildfire Collaborative? So many topics listed, but attention to traditional methods of fire management seems to be missing. Um, is there any response to that? Is there any uh, comments to that? I know, Roger, um, you, I know we've talked about this in the past, and you had some thoughts about how the collaborations with indigenous communities are key. Did, did you wanna build on that? Well, I'll, ju I'll just say that the capacity building is for all rural communities is very important and that's a major focus area within our Strategic Growth Council funded innovation center. And so our main interaction right now with indigenous partners is through our work with on the ground projects where the indigenous partners are part of the collaborative. It takes a community to do these forest restoration projects and they need the capacity to be part of the community. And, and that's, I think, where we're, where we're putting our fo focus on a couple of projects right now. Uh, are there any other comments? Well, I just think, you know, more, more broadly, um, you know, I, I think that we really want to make sure that um, we were able to look at the full suite of um, vegetation management strategies for the future. And I think that um, we, it, it, we should um, definitely be looking at these cultural burning practices as a potential um, strategy that we could, we could try, try in some way to scale up um, as, as a way to address these larger challenges. And um, so I think that um, we, it would be, it would be really great to um to be able to simulate those for example and that's 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 kind of my wheelhouse um so um i think in general you know i think the academic community is very very keen to um engage on that in that on that front great uh laura did you want to say anything uh, in addition to that or can we move on to the next question i think we should move on <laughs> so the uh i'm trying to summarize a lot of these different sorts of questions that are coming through um and panelists, please feel free to redirect this question or reinterpret it. Um, but uh, there's a there's a, tr a thread in here that looks like well these of these projects are all disparate. They're looking at these problems from different angles, uh, uh, and there's a lot of questions about solving very specific problems, whether it's a biomass to energy problem or a smoke emissions problem. Um, maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, the benefit of working together to identify different dimensions of a challenge. So, for example, if we are talking about wildfire emissions, uh, working together in a collaborative, uh, how could we look at wildfire emissions from um, a large scale 
plume dispersion to a localized emission factor to the potential uh, use of an avoided wildfire emission protocol. This, uh, that one topic has a whole bunch of different components to it. Um, how could working together on something like this help us uh, gain more than this, you know, build a, a whole that's bigger than the sum of its parts? Yeah, go ahead, Michael. You're on mute. Yep. Uh, so uh, indeed, uh, what uh, what was presented uh, today by Alex is only eight uh, large scale project, at least large scale for the typical size of uh, research projects that are uh, in uh, uh, universities and, and research institutions. Uh, and uh, these are already projects that are uh, in multiple layers, uh, that are uh, multidisciplinary, that uh, require uh, a, a large group of, uh, of people uh, to even solve uh, a single problem. And uh, all of these projects uh, have uh, uh, overlap uh, uh, because, again, in order to solve uh, the issue of uh, air quality, you need to have uh, the fire modeling uh, uh, and you need to be able to uh, predict where fire, uh, wildfires will be happening and then uh, what is the climate uh, and, the, and the microclimate that is happening with and where the smoke is going and, and all of these other things. So these projects uh, are also only a part of all of the research that is going on because there are uh, other smaller projects that are uh, single or, or a couple of, uh, of PIs that are working together on a, an even smaller project. So there is all of these different research that is happening and looking at the problem in different angles. And the idea of a collaborative is exactly that, putting together the different ingredients so that uh, for any specific problem, uh, you have uh, the uh, expertise available, but also that uh, every single problem can build on uh, what has been done by other projects. So it's kind of a multi-layered approach because the problem is just uh, huge, it's immense, and, uh, and we need to find a way to, to tackle it. Uh, so in, the, in terms of air quality, you already have multiple layers, but even that uh, can benefit other projects that are working on uh, on different issues. So it's all a question of uh, coordinating the efforts, not only of these large projects, but these projects with uh, other researchers that can contribute. I think that's really the, the key of, uh, of what we are discussing here. No one uh, can do everything by themselves. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, if you read the last few questions that are coming in, and this is great. Um, attendees keep streaming those questions, and there's a lot of really great ones. I'm going to try to hit as many as we can. But but there is this thread of, like, how to be proactive. There is a lot of work already being done out there. Um, and the Francis asked a great question over here is, you know, California has been the cradle of development for wildfire management systems through the coordination efforts at federal, state, and local agencies. How is, um, how is the UC effort linked to these statewide fire management efforts? Or how could, an, uh, how could a consortium that Alex and Laura are talking about um, allow the UCs to contribute to a, or advance in a more proactive statewide system? Anyone want to take a crack at that one? Yeah, okay. So I think it's important to understand the value of both science and the operational activities and the collaboration in between them. Uh, so that's often the underappreciated part of uh, transferring or translating scientific and technological findings to uh, use inspired or societally applicable scenarios like this. And this effort is exactly that, the way I see it. There is definitely basic research and science and technology development that happens through these smaller, although they are large, they are still small in the context of the big thing. And then a collaborative like this brings together and provides that gluing infrastructure. And that infrastructure can come from different things. One is definitely the practices for solving problems 
together. And that's what is related to uh, the convergence research. So there is actually a way to make that happen, but there's very little that goes towards that. So we can collectively provide solutions. The second is um, technical and scientific gluing opportunities. Uh, as Michelle said, these are different scales. Um, and the projects that are highlighted today, which are very few, they are uh, looking at it another scale, you know, the collaboration and integration of different bits. But the collaborative looks at it at the larger scale where uh, things like um, data, knowledge management, and uh, representation of the insights coming from these projects can be put together to integrate in larger solutions, more systemic and system of system style solutions. So it would be one on the legal side, one on the natural sciences side, one on the technology side. And on top of that, bringing together that convergence collaboration picture, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to work. And that goes uh, to force the collaboration of science, industry, academia, and uh, also state and local governments. Thank you. Anybody else want to add? anything to that? I want to add just a little bit. I, I am not at a UC and one thing that I really appreciate about this effort is the idea of inclusiveness, right? The, inclu the inclusion of scientists that are willing to go and drive and be part of a solution for a larger impact. Uh, there's a lot of questions that were going through the thread here about uh, some folks being at smaller universities, how could they contribute? Uh, going back to that one question about how do we integrate the knowledge from indigenous communities, which is its own academic right with its own uh, set traditions and norms that we could all learn from and integrate as well. Um, I think it just just to be clear, Alex, if I'm interpreting the way that you, you and Laura have this set up right, the idea is to be inclusive of all those different voices um, because a collaborative science is better than competitive science for something for a problem this large. I don't know. If, if I got that all right, did you want to comment on that? <laughs> no, I mean, that's that's exactly it. You know, I think that we, um, you know, the, the big picture is I think that we, you know, the, the research need is just so huge and um, the capacity is is there and latent, but it's scattered. And, um, and you know, I think we need a mechanism to um, you know, to bring people in and and to to get them thinking about cooperating and working together. Um, so so um, you know, I, I think we we definitely want to want to um, welcome capabilities um, that are key, and um, and and we certainly aren't, aren't selecting by institution. <laughs> I think we're open to everybody. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, another question came in um, from Loretta. Um, how do we like? If you guys want me to read it, I could read it. Have you begun a discussion as how to best unify and coordinate the data and tools that emerge from the projects as a collective, the eight projects that we've talked about? Um, and if so, what are your thoughts in recognizing that much of this data is publicly funded and needs to stay open source? So I guess uh, if we can maybe highlight, you know, there's a lot of project PI leads over here. Maybe talk about how you've been able to work with some of the other programs and how we've been able to create a collaborative of collaboratives where we're able to share data and share the knowledge between the different groups. Does that sound like a, a, a way to illustrate this? Yeah. Who wants to take the first crack at this? If not, I'm gonna, all right, right. you're right. Go ahead. <laughs> I have a comment too, David. Yeah. Sure, thank you. I think it's just important to note that there are a lot, of, there's not just overlap in data, but there's overlap in personnel. There's a bunch of us who are working in two, three, four, or more of these projects. Uh, and that's how we've had the informal capacity to collaborate and coordinate so we share models and we share data. The problem is really providing a long-term uh, capacity to keep the data accessible and available and uh, you know to migrate it to new formats and new systems uh, with time so we don't lose it and uh, uh, to identify the gaps where we need to fill things in. Uh, Roger? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight a parallel effort that some of us at UC under an initiative called UC Water worked with DWR and the State Water Resources Control Board and other water-related 
agencies at, to define a decision-based data and information system. Now, uh, the agencies took the dog bill to that, that said create a better water data system to do a little more strategic planning, which we did uh, with, with funding we had. And so we decided that we needed these focus groups and stakeholder interviews to actually develop what are the top decisions and the data needed to define them before going to design, designing a federated data system. So I think a stimulus from the state may be needed and then you see can really help out in, in the ways we've done before. Yeah, no, that sounds like it's a, there's a proven template for that. So maybe we just replicate a proven template uh, to, to address wildfires. Go ahead, uh, Mike, uh, Michael G, then Michael B. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I think um, if you asked all the folks on this call how they feel about sharing data, I actually think they would all say, we are, we're totally happy to share data. And um, we've already started to share data amongst ourselves and, and make, um, make arrangements. And um, so, so I actually think we're in pretty good shape um, with the commitment to, to share data. I, I think that the challenge it's a structural challenge. How do you build a structure that facilitates that? And I think it's a long-term um, time horizon um, uh, challenge because because most of these projects, you know, they're funded in these three, four, five-year blocks. And um, um, the project I'm involved in, we're going to produce a lot of data. Um, what um, what what? what the plan is to continue to make those data available when the project ends. I, I just, I, I actually don't know really. Can, can I chime in with just another point quickly? Sure. Uh, sorry. Um, which is that, you know, every time there's a data exchange, it's not just the data that's exchanged. There's also a knowledge and a collaboration that's created and is necessary to facilitate the data sharing. Um, so it, it's so much deeper than just, dumping data on somebody, it, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an activity and a collaboration and that requires resources. Um, so I, I think when we, it's, we all believe in sharing data and we all want to share, but that, that act of collaborating requires um, us to dedicate time and, and resources. I just wanted to just make that quick point. <laughs> yeah, no, it sounds like it, the, the whole idea of sustaining knowledge is really important. I'm gonna go to Michael B, then Leela, and then we'll just go in circles. <laughs> yeah, so I want to just to bring up uh, two uh, practical issues uh, with, uh, with, uh, uh, with data, but with the collaboration in general. Uh, on one side is the fact that uh, often uh, the funding agencies are very siloed and uh, they don't care too much about uh, how your data can be used for other applications. They want their product uh, and that's it. Uh, so that is uh, a structural issue that we find because uh, we share the data, but uh, there is not really a mechanism to keep them uh, uh, updated and uh, to pay for the sharing and to pay for maintaining that. So you need to kind of uh, come up with your own uh, resources to do that. There is yeah. a problem on the side of the universities and uh, uh, the, the universities, I would say, because uh, sharing data and developing collaborations uh, unless it brings fundings and allows you to write papers, it's not really recognized uh, in, uh, in, in your career, in the way you advance in your career. So both uh, the funding agencies and the university should uh, really think through their mechanism and uh, recognize more the importance of sharing data, sharing knowledge, uh, and uh, keeping uh, this infrastructure uh, alive uh, beyond the, the duration of a single project. There's, there's a theme that's popping up, is the sustainability and duration of not only data, but uh, knowledge, the knowledge base, the community that's developing that knowledge base. How do, we, how do we sustain that? And how do we extend that beyond the traditional project cycle? And if you look at uh, a question from Alex, is you know it's mainly focused on 
uh, functioning across projects, which are supported by the state and UC efforts, but what are the recommendations for supporting these efforts beyond those funding cycles? And what's the recommendation for formalizing those efforts? I think that's, that's, a, that's our key challenge. And I think one of the things that Alex and Laura, you guys have pitched up um, to get us all started on this thing is, is the idea of creating a, that, the Wildfire Consortium with sustained funding to be able to maintain some of the things that the question has above like, what Klaus was asking, which is like, you know, it's one and dones don't work uh, for, for driving large scale impacts. You know, these things need to be um, developed, sustained where they are having impacts. People need to be able to get credit for them in whatever professional cycles they're actually in. And then um, we learn and grow from that. It sounds, it seems like that's a thread that's coming through not only the questions, but a lot of the responses that folks are talking about. Leela, did you have something to add there? Um, yes, I'll get to you, I, uh, I want to build upon this. I think uh, to me, the idea of the consortium is actually to facilitate this, uh, for us to transfer uh, our knowledge to those that matter for operation, for those that will take action. And, uh, and I feel like this is how we make this sustainable. Everything we find, well, grants we went and everything we went, but we need to create a means for, such that what we found will be transferred, transfer those that matter, that will take action. So we need to, to listen, to listen to those in operation, to decision makers, to first, first responders. What do they need from us? How can we transfer this out of the science? We are scientists. That's all we do to make a difference. That's the way I think we will make this sustainable and it will make sense everything we are doing here today, in my view as well, right? Wonderful. Um, go ahead. Okay. So uh, I would like to point out the different scales of data and products that we are all dealing with. So some of the projects which are looking at really small scale aspects of wildfires those are uh, physics-based or engineering-driven applications. And there are also data and models that we are dealing with that are much larger scale. So uh, the one problem that we often face is uh, to understand who is interested in what type of data. So one big consortium, which is bigger than the sum of its parts, would actually help us to understand what agency is interested in what type of data and uh, what are the necessary skills and the types of data that we can share with them. And this also goes back to us a little bit. So different jurisdictions in California, they have their own data standards. For example, the Federal, the Forest Service, Cal Fire, or the Air Resources Board, they have their own data sets and their own standards. So we actually, when we're trying to build something together, we find that the data sources are quite different. And they, they are dealing with entirely different things, although uh, the bigger, maybe the, the, the problem goal is the same. So uh, I think we can think about uh, data standards and uh, exchange, data exchange standards that can be unified across the board. So that will help everybody. Um, Leroy, and then I, I'd like to move us beyond, you know, why don't we ask it this way? And, and Leroy, I like throwing you under the bus because you're really good at it. <laughs> uh, so so data, we know data is a big challenge, right? We know data is a huge issue, but we also know dealing with policymakers and decision makers is a huge issue. And they're typically not dealing with the big, huge petabytes of data. It's usually that last mile of information that feeds into the policy itself or the, or the management activity itself, whether that's a management, a vegetation man management activity type or some sort of air pollution emission regulatory component. Can, um, and can you talk a little bit about how, how that, how building something like this could help with that last mile development or push into, into that policy decision-making or vegetation management decision-making? It's not just a question of data sustainability or formats or anything like that. It's about accessibility, capacity building, right? translation, curation. Um, there's, there's a huge spectrum of products that just these eight projects, which are, are just a minority of what's going on in the state, produce different time and spatial scales. And um, it takes a lot of expertise, actually, to know what to be looking at for a particular question or problem. It's not like we can just 
dump it out there on a web portal and people can come access it and answer all their questions. Um, and, and the consortium that we're talking about, I think would have a lot of its cap permanent capacity focused on that task of curation, communication, relationship building, and, uh, you know, just within some of the projects I'm involved in across these eight, I think it's four of them, there's a bunch of efforts underway to start developing tools that help people curate these things, help people interact and learn from the different uh, scenarios uh, that are being explored in the projects. And that has a long way to go. But I, I think that that function of, of translation, curation, communication, and, and making condensed data accessible uh, for and identifying the right products for the right users is really central to what uh, a consortium would do, which is uh, Michael. Thanks, Leroy. Michael? Uh, building on what Leroy was saying, uh, it's not only a question of data, is uh, a question of uh, knowledge and information that needs to be extracted from the data. And uh, again, having uh, a, uh, a group of uh, researchers together uh, that are looking at the problem from an higher uh, point of view, uh, a collaborative uh, like the one that we are discussing, is also providing uh, that expertise uh, so that from the data that was produced in previous project or in current project, the information that is needed for a particular application can be extracted and provided to the people that then are going to make the decisions. Uh, this is usually something that is not necessarily funded uh, at the beginning of a project because again, it's for a specific product, but whatever is produced in one of the different project ongoing can be reused uh, with the appropriate expertise to extract the right information for other applications. And in this kind of uh, syner synergetic uh, effect can only happen when you have the expertise and the infrastructure to extract that information. Yeah, I mean, if you look at, oh, go ahead, okay. And then I'm gonna come. I could go after you. Well, no, I'm just looking at Michael's question that's coming out but right now. It's like, how is the collaborative integrating with local governments who need to take action now, capital now? So I hear it. <laughs> Maybe I can also take <laughs> Yeah, we've worked with Leroy individually, but no other academics or institutions. So Leroy, you're off the hook, but the rest of us is like, well, how, you know, how can local government, uh, state government actually integrate more closely in a, in a proactive, systematic way with the learnings that are coming out of the, out of academia? It's, is what I'm hearing that question. What kind of incentives could be built around that? And Ilke, yes, go for it. <laughs> so I think it's also going to integrate both of my answers. Uh, the part that relates to the uh, discussion before, I think recognizing openness and collaboration of models and data is important. And it often doesn't mean everybody can access to it, but open means transparency and sharing. And when it comes to data and modeling, one size won't fit all, especially in a time of change like we are experiencing on all fronts. Our ability to take the data and learn from it and turn that into knowledge insights collectively to integrate into solutions is important. And it hasn't been achieved to its full potential until now because uh, there are inconsistencies between how data and modeling needs and actual sensitivities of fire behavior in various conditions. So all of these need to be captured. And when that happens, I think there's a role also both for uh, local government, state and uh, the researchers. So this is not just a scientific goal anymore. It's also an applied working together in you know, integrated closed loop uh, workflows, so to say, together. And an example of that is actually happening right now in, as an example to the last question, so I'm answering now this question, uh, <laughs> is the virus system that's active. Uh, last year it was a Southern California uh, pilot and this year is at the state level. This is an aircraft-based system that is a public-private partnership 
uh, through Cal OES and Orange County Fire Authority and others. And it is about collecting data about the ongoing fires through a fixed wing aircraft with infrared capabilities. And that data through industry partners like Intera and AVEX is the aviation company that gets made available to uh, in real time to uh, all of the agencies in California and through a fusion center that led by uh, LA Fire Department and uh, right now actually an happening, uh, a North Center is happening in Cal OES. It gets integrated into fire models. So anyone who is trying to model it using that information, the existing fires can take advantage of it. And in my fire, we do our own things uh, to model that. But the idea here is to demonstrate that open public-private partnership that includes both local government, state government, industry, and academic partners to create uh, communication, translation, infrastructure. Okay, if I, if I understand, if, I, if I'm thinking of the project that you're talking about, I mean, you have an innovative funding mechanism to support that, that conversation. The, yeah. tradi the traditional funding methods that all of us are used to getting as part of research doesn't seem like it's gonna fit for these emerging needs. It seems like there needs to be a, a, new, type, a new type of funding model uh, to help to help this uh, holistic approach. And I know uh, Michael Wara asked that question right on top. Mm -hmm. uh, he recommends a new, uh, recommended research on new funding methods for financing the holistic approach you recommend. Are there any thoughts on, on where that works well? Roger, I know you mentioned one example as it relates to water. Um, are there other potential examples where, where something like this could get put into place to hit those needs that we, we were just talking about? Uh, go ahead, Leroy. So there's the California Nevada Applications Program. It's been funded by NOAA as a nascent sort of climate outreach activity for California and Nevada for 21 years now. Uh, they haven't had uh, the scale in terms of the funding and resources to, you know, fully play this role across so many different sectors, let alone, uh, you know, just serve all the needs in, for, for wildfire. But they're a model for sort of that sustained uh, integrative function, integrative and, and outreach function that, that we're talking about. Anybody else? No, go ahead, okay. I just wanted to emphasize, uh, definitely alternative funding mechanisms are needed and activity on, you know, on the public, private and academic side is needed on all of these. And the biggest value for academia or a collaborative like this of that activity is that blueing capability of the ability of the data that's collected about the societal at the societal scale being made a part of scientific activity. Similarly, with the utilities, also data has been collected. But as uh, one of us said before, this type of having data available, make, making it the infrastructure for data for others to take advantage of, isn't in the mission of any of these efforts. So. When it comes to partnerships, I think seeing data and other things, not just data modeling and other types of infrastructural capabilities as integral to it and making that happen will benefit uh, everyone participating in it. And I think it's also good for the economy to make sure we have uh, the right uh, innovation mechanisms enabled through this effort. Wonderful. Um, uh, does anybody else want to comment on that? All right, so I have another question. <laughs> it, it comes it uh, comes in one of the veins that was further up, and okay, this builds on your your public private partnership, academic partnership, sort of things. And um, Dave Marvin from Salo Sciences, um, I know you're a private sector, uh, you know, participant in a large in this large thing. What part has worked well in this collaboration in terms of being able to contribute and add as well as being able to reach places where academia traditionally hasn't been able to reach, vice versa. The flow of information and knowledge. Not, don't wanna talk about data or data products. <laughs> um, 
Thank you, Dave. Uh, I think that just the willingness to be open to conversations with organizations like uh, what I'm involved in um, and others and just inviting us to participate has been uh, tremendous um, and keeping us involved, um, not just having a one-time uh, conference or one-time meeting, but actively inviting us to be involved in meetings on a quarterly basis, uh, sharing information, uh, reaching out to us for uh, you know, information on access to data or other resources, I think it's been very fruitful for us um, and has helped us maintain our involvement over time. So I think just being very open to other uh, technology providers and other um, scientists who are, you know, not in the academic realm, but are at NGOs like the Nature Conservancy um, or other, uh, you know, local NGOs who have science capacity, have technology capacity, uh, but don't always you know, had the big names um, <laughs> next to them to, you know, and the resources to be able to uh, provide in input into these consortiums uh, would be my recommendation. Oh, great. Um, did anybody else want to add to that? I know Dave's from the private sector collaborating with academia. Does anybody else have uh, expertise from being in academia and having a productive collaboration in the private sector specific to wildfire to help sustain some of these research elements? Anybody, anybody? I do, but I'm not going to talk. <laughs> Ilki, I know you do with the utility as well. I call it David. David. <laughs> Go ahead. I, Go ahead. Say, I think you could respond to your own question because it's, yeah. you've been successful in that realm as well. I think you can talk, David. I'm allowed to talk? All right. <laughs> well, well, you know, honestly, what, what I found in terms of actually creating this flow of information, and it's, it's really important, each of these different institutions are really good at certain things and really have strong limitations in other things, um, is, the, is the fact to have these transboundary organizations, right? Uh, have, an, have an organization that could actually work between academic and uh, the private sector or between the private sector and the NGO community or the NGO community and the government sector. And what's neat about, and I, I know no one's really speaking about this, but what's really neat about the, everyone that's on this call and the projects that we have on this call we have a lot of uh, elements of those boundary organizations established and that flow of information between those major institutions is running, but it's running on duct tape, bubble gum and good luck, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it's built off of the, the strength of personalities and relationships and that works well for certain things. But if, if something like this is gonna be sustained and the idea of having a proactive um, integrated response from academia into the wildfire science community, bubblegum's not going to do it, right? At, at some point, there needs to be some, uh, some uh, institutional support that allows the natural science to be connected with the social science, to be connected with the economics of things, to be connected with the technologists. And, and that needs to be hardened and fortified in a way to allow us to make those long-term impacts in an, in an agile environment that we're all hoping for. That's what I see. Now, I haven't been screening for the next question, so someone's gonna have to help me pop up with the next question because we have five minutes left. Um, well, why don't we, oh, go ahead, Laura. I have an idea. Yeah, there's a, there's a question I think that is an important one, um, yeah. which uh, came in a little while ago, but uh, what specific actions would you or we want California policymakers to take in the next 24 months recognizing that resources are limited <laughs> or will be limited. Um, so I think, you know, this is a question asking if, if we see an opportunity for the state to make some kind of an investment in this space, I think is, is what that question is getting at. That's a great question. So I think it's a great question. So who so, wants to take it since I asked it? I'm gonna pick on Michael, G. <laughs> wow. Um... I think one thing that's needed is um, planning. In, one thing needed among a group like this and a broader group is improved planning, improved coordination, um, improved design. Um, you know, rather than run out there and um, for us as a group and try and try and um, uh, solve problems, we need to sort of get our um, uh, consortium. Uh, plan in in place. Um, specifically with regards to what um, California should do, I, I don't really know. That is a 
really difficult um, question. I know Alex has some thoughts on this. Alex, why don't you give us some thoughts? I, I, love, I love getting picked on. Um, <laughs> let's see. You know, I, I was thinking about this a little bit in the context of limited resources, you know, because the NSF puts together these sustainable research network calls where you, the idea is to catalyze a network of people with, you know, a, a few million dollars of resources. And I, I, I wonder if something like that, at least in the short term, wouldn't be effective to, um, to at least provide the, um, the ability for us to do things like share data and collaborate and, and coordinate the existing projects better. Um, and then to build out the planning for something more robust and sustainable later on, which I think requires I believe a lot more resources, um, um, you know, when, when funding does become more, more plentiful. So I'm wondering if there isn't some kind of interim step where, where, where we get some infusion of resources that, that helps us with collaboration and coordination that builds, helps us build the foundation for something uh, more organized later on. We have two minutes left. Okay, do you wanna give us a final thought before I hand it back to Alex? So if we have two minutes left, I'll give up my time. I was just going to mention the convergence program at NSF, providing an opportunity. Give, uh, give me a minute of it. That's fine. Okay. Uh, if that's a business. If that's a model that could that the state could actually use to help yes. help support something like this. That might be great. Some of the more recent Wi-Fi funding on Wi-Fi Commons. This is to create a common infrastructure. Comes from this NSF program called Convergence Accelerator, and this is about convergence of different stakeholders to solve a societal challenge. And there are different tracks to it. There's the knowledge sharing, knowledge network track, there's an AI model sharing track, and there are others for training and workforce development and things like that. And the goal is to find a problem, to work together and apply a use inspired research framework uh, to apply to the problem. Uh, but as you said, Alex, this type of programs provide the catalyzer or accelerator for it. And at that point, uh, it's on the community, I think, to find a way to sustain it and uh, find uh, pathways for uh, building it in a way that uh, stakeholders take some of the responsibility for sustaining. So the idea is for is to look at the NSF model as one potential model that the state could implement yeah. to help sustain this sort of thing. I think that's a great idea. Um, Alex, we're, I'm out of time. I'm handing the torch back to you. <laughs> and um, yeah, and I think I think Roger was going to close us out. Okay. Roger. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone. I, I Clearly, this could have gone on for another hour or two. Just, just a couple comments before I, I really close this out. And, and that is one of the things about all this partnership. I'm so glad there was a focus on that because one of the things that I think climate change research in general has shown that you do have to partner with so many people, uh, private sector, local and state governments. And, and one I wanna really emphasize, which I think was briefly alluded to, the user community. Uh, they have to be at the table uh, and part of the conversation. And it has to be a two-way conversation. It can't be academics just telling them what they need to do. We need to listen to them and understand what they want. The other, only other comment I wanna make is about data and open data. I, I will just, there's a lot of comments I could make about it, but I will say that uh, we've shown in a crisis what open data and making it readily available has done. And that's with COVID-19. Uh, I think that's been the poster child of not only open data and, and letting everybody have at it and making sure it was available in a form they could understand, but also open results, open sharing of uh, research results internationally, not just um, nationally. So I wanna thank all those panelists for their contributions. I wanna thank the audience for joining us. I, you know, I sincerely wished I could all ask you to let's walk to the adjacent room and join us for coffee and continued discussion. And I'm hoping that that's not too far in the future that we can do that. Uh, and I also hope this is just the beginning of the conversation on this issue that impacts all of us. I wanna remind the attendees that there is a recording. I noticed there was a question or two uh, there, there will be a recording. It will be shared once it's ready. And it's going to be posted actually on the UCLA Government and Com Community Relations website. Uh, I think we'll provide the information, but those that have a little pen or pencil handy, it's simple. It's going to be located at the advocacy.ucla.edu website. 
So thanks once again and enjoy the rest of your day.